It's a great pleasure, and it's, it's a challenge. And, uh, well, it's a treat to be here at this very important moment in our Russian, Ukrainian, and I would argue in European history. And it's apparently, it's a rare situation when a Russian from Moscow would endorse what Ukrainian has been speaking. Because our two countries, Russia and Ukraine, are at war. True, Ukraine still cannot find the ability or maybe resources to respond. Well, it's very difficult to give due to the Russian perspective, you know, on the current drama that is unfolding. So I will be trying um, to lay out my thesis in a very uh, crude and telegraphic style in a way of brush strokes. So for starters, my major concern, it's becoming already a trivial and conventional truth to say that the post-Cold War settlement is unraveling, which it does. Which means that a lot of previous axioms, truths, stereotypes have been put under question. The major problem is that it had to unravel because it was based on illusions, misperceptions, and hopes. And hope, as we know, is always a delayed disappointment. But the major problem today is that we are unprepared to deal with the current situation. And in the intellectual community, well, in all countries and overseas, both in Russia and everywhere else, is zigzagging between puzzlement, shock, amazement, and paralysis. And this is apparently our major challenge and the major intellectual and political threat. And now, if I may, my points. First point is on the crisis of the post-Soviet model. This post-Soviet model has dominated in all countries that emerged on the territory of the former Soviet Union, with the exception of Bolts. They succeeded to jump the ship. And the crisis of the post-Soviet model has happened firstly in Ukraine. This is the weakest link, apparently. And the whole system based on personalized and corrupted power has gone down in flames. And here I would like to attract your attention to the way it went down in flames. Through revolution, through Maidan, people taking to the streets. And there are all evidence and ground to conclude that apparently we cannot hope anymore for the usual pactismo, for the usual way of transition, transformation, that other countries, or velvet revolutions, that other countries enjoyed during the previous 50 years. Apparently, there are much more ground, ground to conclude that it will be revolution with all unpleasant things, unraveling, turmoil, people on the street, and geopolitical consequences. When we are looking not only on the European new independent states, but further on. Second point. Second point is, as Gerald asked me to do, on Putin's doctrine. Until 2013, the key premise of the Russian matrix, of the Russian system, was we are just like you, Europeans, and we are moving to integrate, to join you folks. This system was based on the imitation of liberal and democratic institutions, not anymore. Today, Putin is testing a new doctrine, and the premise of this doctrine is we are different. We are specific, unique state civilization. And we need to counter, to deter, to contain the demoralized Euro-Atlantic community. And Russia has always been, the Kremlin says, the center of gravity for the galaxy that has to be surrounded by satellite states. And it's not only about return of Russia to the old-style Soviet imperialism. It's not about only land grabbing. It's not about our Russian grabbing of the Ukrainian territory. It's, something, it's about something much more important that never existed even during Yalta 1945. It's about Russia uh, fighting for the right to interpret the international treaties and rules of the game. It's about the right for Putin to be terminator 
and the arbitrator of the international situation. Point number three on Ukraine. What is Ukraine for the Kremlin and Putin's doctrine? Ukraine is an instrument. Ukraine is the means. Ukraine is simply a testing ground where he's testing his new doctrine. And Ukraine is the means to experiment with a new model of mobilization of the Russian population around the Kremlin through the enemy search, around the model of the besieged fortress. And Ukraine gives him opportunity to combine the internal and external enemies. Bandera of any extremists in Ukraine, supported by the Western Americans and financed by the Western Europe, and at the same time supported by the fifth column and national traitors in Russia. Well, ironically and bitterly, he is following Hitler's playbook. Fourth point, what about implication of post-Crimea situation? There are a lot of them, but I will only define a couple. Well, in fact, what is happening now is unraveling of the treaty system. You know, post-modernity, and Ivan Krusty wrote about this in one of the most, uh, you know, provocative and perhaps the best article on what is happening in Russia. Yes, well, post-modernity is a kind of chessboard kicked over. It doesn't exist already with all these treaties, soft power, and everything that Europeans have been so accustomed to. There are new security challenges because Putin, in fact, has started a new war, the war of the new type, the war with the new warfare, people with insignias on the territory of another state, and nobody admits the fact. Uh, CFE, uh, Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty, it has to be, Europe has to return to that because Russia withdrew from the uh, treaty on a C CFE and now Russian troops could be stationed anywhere. The non-proliferation regime is also being abandoned with Russia getting out of 1994 Budapest Agreement on getting guarantees to Ukraine for Ukraine's readiness to get rid of nuclear weapons. And, and other security and energy, and energy threats that, well, that could be a long list. And the final point. The final point is about the West. Well, my friend Olga already uh, at least delivered, well, her assumptions on what the West could do. I would say that we hardly, and here apparently I would agree uh, with our final colleague uh, speaker on the panel who said that the Ukrainian policy m means, you know, to have Russian policy as well, if I correctly understood. Well, what the West has to do, the West has to have a foreign policy, which the West has none. The West has to have a joint common European policy. It means that Americans and Europeans have some common posture, position on the region, including the policy on Russia, which does not exist. The West has gone beyond tactical means and instruments because sanctions, Olga, sanctions and assistance, simply it's means, it's tactical means. It doesn't mean a vision on the region. Well, the West has to give Ukraine guarantees of territorial integrity and sovereignty. And Ukraine is going to be for the West the testing ground too on the Western ability to practice what the West preaches. And finally, we have to be prepared for eventualities. We have to be prepared for fragile, vulnerable post-Soviet region and territory. And for the fact that Putin has got engaged in the bobsled. You know bobsled when one cannot get out of the bob. What he's doing is a suicidal statecraft. He cannot stop and he cannot succeed. And that means that he cannot guarantee Russia's stability. He can, cannot guarantee, you know, his own staying in power because 71% of Russians supporting what he's doing now and among them only guess how much? Only 55%. Yes, already 55% would like him to leave the Kremlin. So the situation is pretty vulnerable for him too. So we all have to be prepared for another intellectual and political challenge, which would mean the crisis of the Russian matrix and its geopolitical and civilizational 
repercussions of this fact.